two things to say before I start off. First of all, I have a bad habit of wandering around when I'm giving talks, which doesn't necessarily work with a fixed microphone. So if I wander off and you can't hear me, please shout at me and I'll wander back. Second thing, um, by all means, feel free to yell, ask questions, et cetera, during the talk. I will try and respond. You can save them to the end, but if I say something you think is crazy or questionable or whatever, don't hesitate to jump in and say so. All right, with that said, the title, SRT Science Platform Vision and the Escape Open Science Platform. These are, it's a slightly weird title. So this was given to me by the organizers and it's, they're kind of related, but not the same. And so I spent a bunch of time thinking, how do we best address both of those in kind of one talk or make it into a coherent whole? And I was thinking also about some of the, the discussions we've heard over the last couple of days, where we've seen some quite high level overviews of what's coming with SKA and people shouting words like big data. And then we've heard that yesterday, particularly from Jesus and his virtual observatory talk, something that, that got into the, the real technical nitty gritty. Anytime somebody starts talking about Kubernetes, I think we, we're getting pretty low level. So what I wanted to do here was try and hit a middle ground and say, right, people keep talking about science platforms in that discussion. But when we say science platform, what are we actually talking about? What are these science platform things anyway? How do they fit together? How do they fit in? What are the problems they solve? Just, did you want a microphone? No, it's fine. I'm, I'm no. Thank you. Um, all right. So in order to address that, we're going to take it in four pieces here. First of all, we're just going to put aside science platforms and say, well, we keep talking about big data. Why is big data hard? What are the actual problems that big data is causing us that we need to get to grips with? Then we're gonna say, and in fact, Susanna's introduction was a perfect introduction to this. What do we actually mean when we say science platform? We hear platforms, gateways, virtual research environments, whatever else it is. What is this? It's a kind of amorphous concept that no one's really got a, a, a super strict definition for. Then from there, I'm gonna to segue to the, the actual things that I was supposed to talk about. And we'll hit on the SKA science platform vision. That's fairly brief because the SKA science platform vision is so far document rather than actual code you can go and use. So from there, we'll talk about the work we did in Escape and a couple of other projects that I hope are more immediately usable and relevant and show us the way that we're moving in the era of the SKA. So that's the plan. That's where we're going. Let's start, if I can play the slide to advance, with this. So big data. This is a plot from a decadal review white paper by Vendana Desai et al. So the decadal review, as you're probably aware, every 10 years, the American astronomical community gets together and says, what are our community-wide priorities for the next 10 years? And they do this by means of a whole white paper and discussion exercise. And so this group here put together a really nice white paper about the need for science platforms. And they opened with this plot, which I think is really apposite as we we're talking about the, the big data future. And what you can really see here is in the decade from kind of 2020 to 2030, they're plotting data volumes associated with a kind of miscellaneous grab bag. Some of these are instruments or missions, some are surveys, et cetera. But basically the kind of order of magnitude of data volume we're talking about is increasing by what, two or three orders. We're going from in 2020, 10 to the two or 10 to the three terabytes to by the late 2030s, 10 to the four, and in the, er the late 2020s, 10 to the four, and into the 2030s, we've got this little triangle hanging out in the top right, which is the Rubin Observatory LSST, and that hits 550 petabytes in their final data release in the early 2030s. And so as they say, I mean, that, that, that's a couple of orders of magnitude over a decade. So that's pretty scary stuff. But then, <clears throat> You start realizing this this is all much much as i love our american colleagues etc this is all amateur level at some point because you start thinking about the ska and so philippa presented the the whole regional center story yesterday but and she had a plot that looks like a somewhat prettier version of this but basically you've got these two telescopes one in australia one in south africa they have their own signal processors and science data processors that are generating these science ready data products we don't get access to that. They're within the observatory. 
they're controlled by the observatory, the science community doesn't use them, but they fire the data out to the regional center network, which is responsible for curating and archiving and making them available to the astronomy community and enabling that community to do science. So this is all you already know, but the important thing to look at is what's happening in this box here, 350 petabytes per telescope per year. So 700 total, I think yesterday we heard 600, but really when you're at these kind of numbers, what's 100 petabytes between friend, per year, SKA by the late, by late this decade is generating more, it's kind of off the scale relative to the big optical surveys. This is really serious big data. So why is that hard? So I think a lot of this is, is kind of obvious, but just to, to say it out loud, traditionally, you download data to analyze it on your Traditionally, you download it to analyze it on your desktop workstation. More recently, you download it to analyze it on your laptop. If you are like me, you have a laptop with one terabyte of SSD in it. You're probably all young and modern and have more exciting laptops than me. So maybe you could two terabytes of SSD in it. But that means that you need 700,000 laptops to download your year's worth of SKA data. But that doesn't really matter at all because it'll when your gigabit internet connection, it will take you, if my arithmetic is right, something like 180 years to download it. So you'll be dead before you get it anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but really just making this data available is immediately challenging. You just can't download it and work with it in the same way as normal. But you say, well, that's okay, because usually when we're processing, when we're doing our analysis on data, we probably don't always need to access a year's worth of SKA data. In fact, we want to access some kind of derived data product, like a catalog. So you think about, well, Rubin Observatory, they're big on catalogs. They will issue a catalog in their final data release. 20 billion galaxies, 17 billion stars, 6 million solar system bodies, 10 million transients alerts per night the survey has been operating. So that's 10 million alerts per night times 10 years. In total, that's about a 15 petabyte catalog, which is more tractable than 700 petabytes. So it's good news, we're getting smaller. But it's still something that you, you can't just stick this in your regular database and say, well, I'll run a query and find all the variables in it. Just working with a catalog this size is going to cause your regular database system to explode. And so the Rubin folks are on top of this. They have their um, fancy database system they call QServe. It's a really nice, sharded, distributed, massively parallelized database. It's really clever stuff. But it's really showing you'll, you'll need specialist software, specialist systems, just to be able to work with the catalogs, let alone pixel data. But say you do manage to get some pixel data, you download your SK image queue, and then you, you have something that is still big and complicated. And in fact, um, I think we heard about this really clearly in the previous talk where we were talking about all these, um, Sepida, I think was talking about it, the, the really complex images that she's dealing with, with all these different axes. And certainly it's the same in the SK world. You'll have not just a pixel grid, but you'll have a pixel grid times different polarizations, times different frequencies, whatever. It's a multi-dimensional data. And they're really big. SK is a high resolution instrument. You're talking about 100,000 by 100,000 pixels times all those dimensions. Each image cube is itself many terabytes. Even if you could download that to your laptop, you still can't render it. It won't fit into your video memory. And you still can't understand it. There are too many dimensions to look at. So you have to start thinking about well, how do we make the kind of big complex data understandable? How do we get it, turn it into something that you can look at on your laptop screen? Petabytes of data implies petabytes of computing. Complex data implies complex computing, things like machine learning that are maybe going to benefit from specialist hardware like GPUs your laptop or your departmental cluster is just gonna give up the ghost and go home in disgust. And even then your individual workload, depending on your science case, but probably your individual workload is bursty. You want to be able to spool up a big compute job today and then go away and spend three months looking at the results while you write your paper. That means provisioning lots of small clusters is inefficient because they, they'll be highly used some days and not used at all other days. So the more we can centralize and benefit from economies of scale, we can smooth over those bursts and provide everyone with a consistent level of service. Reproducibility, we heard a lot about this in the previous talk, which was a tour de force, by the way, it was really impressive. Um, this 
definition that you start with up at the top here, this is again from the, the uh, National Academy's uh, white paper that Mohammed talked about earlier, which says reproducibility is obtaining consistent results using the same input data, computational steps, method, and code, and conditions of analysis. So that means we've just made all our problems compounded. You can't just do this analysis yourself, but everybody has to download that data, have access to that computing, get those smart visualization algorithms, et cetera. And you need standardized, repeatable, versionable ways to describe and publish exactly what the analysis you just did was. And then I will hand you over to Mohammed to talk about them. And of course, this again came up yesterday, much of the most exciting science comes from joint analysis. So combining data from multiple facilities. So I find this image here particularly beautiful. So this is a composite, um, an image from LOFAR, which will still be by some measures, the biggest low frequency radio telescope in the world, even in the era of the SKA, combining LOFAR data with Chandra data in an image of Cygnus A, and you really see the, the, the different structures, how you're probing different science, getting complementary results by looking at this kind of multivalent analysis. But if I've got my SKA data in a huge SKA data repository and my Chandra data or whatever it is in some huge other data repository, and it takes me 180 years to transport one to the other and I couldn't store it even if I managed it, how do I do this kind of joint analysis? Of course, in the SKA, as we know, this gets even more complicated because even the SKA data is spread over multiple data centers. Collaboration is fundamentally important. With big data comes big research teams. It's not enough that you can write a script that processes your data, but you'll need to collaborate with your team, with your colleagues, with your collaborators to share data, to share code, to share whatever research artifacts you're producing, ultimately to share papers and the credit for writing those papers. All right, so that was a that was a kind of whistle stop tour of the things that scare me at least when I start thinking about the SK. So we talked about what we talked about, about the challenges of data access. We talked about the challenges of even querying data. We talked about the challenges of visualizing the data, of doing our computing on the data, of reproducing our analysis, of interoperating across multiple facilities, and then doing all of that in collaborative teams. So what are we going to do about it? Well. It will not surprise you to learn, given the, the topic of this talk, that the solution, or at least a proposed solution, is the science platform. And at this point, I want to put the, the, or expand on the caveat, perhaps, that I started with. The, there isn't a dictionary or a rule book or whatever that you can look at, and it will say, yes, a science platform is X. There are as many different definitions, understandings, assumptions about science platforms or gateways or portals or virtual research environments or whatever else as you want to come up with. I don't want to try and get into a, a dictionary game here of defining, trying to figure out all the details. I want to adopt an inclusive, expansive definition of science platforms for the purpose of this talk. I'm not worried too much about whether any individual system is in or out. But so I'm starting here from the definition. This is in the famous SKA Regional Center Science Analysis Platform Vision document, which we'll come back to later. And they write, science analysis platform provides scientists with a computer environment that permits collaborative handling of large and diverse data sets and allows them to access large scale computing resources that they may not have locally available. Science analysis platforms are typically designed to provide consistency for all users while providing access to appropriate tools and data. I think it's not a bad definition. And it's kind of what I tried to capture in this cheesy illustration here. It's the science platform is some sort of service that the science community is accessing over the internet. So it's a remote service. They come in and when, when you connect to this server, service, you get data discovery, you get the ability to access data, to analyze data, to visualize the data. But that's kind of the top layer of a multi-level architecture where underlying that there is some sort of data management and computing orchestration system. And underlying that there's some kind of physical infrastructure of data storage and computing. And part of the point of this is it hides all that from you. You don't need to worry about the physical form that these systems take because you get this nice convenient abstraction sitting on the top that makes it easy and accessible and usable. So that is what I'm talking about when I talk about science platforms. 
those platforms of that form of that type, then there's a bunch of common components. So as I say, we're not going to read the rule book and say your platform must do X and must not do Y. But I think it is worth spending a few minutes to just talk to and say, well, when we talk about a science platform, what is it typically aiming to provide us with? And so the first thing that I'm going to call the portal is kind of the, the first thing you hit when you go to your science portal and say, I want to get some work done. Or so you go to your science platform, I want to get some work done. I want to work with my SKA data, my Rubin data, or in the example of the screenshot shown here, my data from ESO telescope. So this is the ESO science portal I'm showing here. And basically what I'd expect you to do is you go to the portal and it lets you log in because it needs to know what you have access to, what data do you have access to, what services do you have access to, what computing do you have access to, what, what are your rights in the system. But then it's also giving you quick access, easy access to get the access to the data that you need most immediately. So you can come in again in the ESO is a great example here, you can search by position or you can search by target, or you can quickly filter and say, well, only show me things from the VLT or whatever. And it will quickly pull up a list of fixed files in this case, I think, and let you hit a download button. So if your data is plausibly downloadable, you can get at it quickly. And then it can give you the option to drill down into more specific functionality, visualization tools or analysis environments or whatever else it is. But the whole aim of this is then to make the data as accessible as possible by abstracting away the size and complexity. And I will say a huge props to ESO for this. I think the ESO example here is really nice. This is by the standards of certainly much astronomy software historically, the ESO portal, it looks nice, it's easy to use, it provides you with a range of compelling functionality, huge prop to e props to ESO for putting together stuff like this, building, of course, on a range of open source components, note the Aladdin logo hiding away in the top right of the screenshot there. Next thing I want to draw your attention to is visualization. We kind of, um, well, we did mention visualization already, but I think it's worth drawing this out as specifically something that science platforms can provide you with, with rich support for. And so, again, I think it was Mattia yesterday mentioned CARTA. And again, I think CARTA is a model application of this sort. So CARTA is fundamentally based around the idea of progressive access to data. The data itself lives on some remote computer. Your laptop, the screen you're looking at, has only a certain number of pixels on it. Transporting all of the data onto your laptop just so that you can down sample and down select until you have as many data points as you have pixels to display is a pretty silly way to do things. So what Carta does is help you shift that to the server side. Carta will figure out intelligently what you're actually looking at, and it can then only send you the data that enables you to work to fill your screen with the things you want to see. Obviously, it's smarter than that. I mean, there's a whole lot of complexity in there, but that's the model. By being smart about what data we transmit, we can make the visualization problem much more attractive. And so I've also borrowed a figure from Bezos who talked to us yesterday as he's our SRC architecture. Role. He's been figuring out how you can fit this model into the SRC regional center network. I will say CARTA again is a model application of this type. It is exciting to me as someone who's hung around astronomy software for a long time that we now see high quality, modern, easy to use graphical applications like CARTA becoming regularly available. This is really cool. But of course, there are many other applications and this is this is not a something that CARTA is unique in being able to do. It's just a really good example of the type. Um, notebooks. So I think I said we would be inclusive and not rule something is in or something is out of our science platform. But I think the nearest we get to common baseline of what we talk about when we talk about science platform is some kind of notebook system. So it is a really common expectation that you have a Jupyter notebook running next to your data. I think probably everyone is familiar with Jupyter notebooks, but just in case I want to say it out loud, the Jupyter notebook is the interactive browser-based environment where you're interleaving live code. So you type your Python or potentially R or whatever else code execute it within the notebook, you see the results in real time, you can plot figures, they all appear in your browser. But the actual Python interpreter or the R interpreter or whatever is running remotely within our, within our um, science platform. In addition to notebooks, we can make other sorts of interactive analysis applications available. I've, I've put legacy in square, scare quotes here, which is really unfair. Tools like 
CASA and TopCat are absolutely essential. They are, we, they will have to be made available to any kind of plausible science platform because people will need these kind of tools for analysis for a long time to come. And they are absolutely key parts of our, our astronomical software stack. But also we enable command line applications, for example, through SSH. And all of this, the idea that whichever type of tool you're using, there's some kind of interactive system where you are logging in, you're accessing data, you're writing code, you're doing analysis, implies that there has to be some kind of persistent storage level. You need somewhere that you can store your work, store your output products, persist it and come back to it. The next time you want to come, come back to your notebook, it's still going to be there and existing and ready to go and waiting for you. I will take a brief tangent. Again, I'm not sure about the 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 um, exactly who's in the audience, so I want to make sure we're we're really drawing attention to some of the cool technology that's on display here. We've seen, I think, a couple of times already over the last few days, Jupiter Lab. But just to draw your attention to it, Jupiter Lab takes the Jupiter Notebook and makes it super powered. So instead of just being in your browser with a sort of single page application that's got some live code and some some text and some figures in it. Jupyter Labs gives you a really fairly comprehensive environment where you've got terminals, you've got text editors, you've got notebooks, you've got an extension system so you can expand it to include your own applications, all running embedded in your web browser, drawing on resources in your science platform or some remote data center. I think that we already see um, this appearing in more and more places in the science platform universe. And I think interfaces like this really start to demonstrate the power of what we can make available through a science platform type paradigm. Alt workflows. So again, we've we've we mentioned pipelines. In fact, we we, we talked extensively already, I think, about, about pipelines. Um, but when I talk about bulk workflows, what I mean is moving away from that interactive analysis, like the Jupyter Notebook, to a large scale multi stage processing tasks with complex interdependencies that are executed asynchronously on big systems. So there's a lot to unpack there, but the idea is that you're writing some kind of, you're defining some kind of reproducible workflow. So, in fact, this, this figure here, you're in no way expected to read this. I can't read it, I'm standing right next to it. But to say it out loud, it is the single frame processing pipeline for Hyper Supreme Cam. So Hyper Supreme Cam is a big optical camera on the Subaru telescope in Hawaii. They have a software stack, which is kind of based on the one being developed for Rubin LSST. And this is what they do for every CCD with a mixture. There's processing steps and data products all shown in this floor diagram here. They do this for every one of their CCDs. They have 116 CCDs on their cocoa plane. They have many thousands of observations collected over many years. What they want to be able to do is say, well, here's how you process one CCD. Now go off and do all of them. Big processing task, lots of interdependencies. And tell me when it's done. So it's asynchronous. I'll come back and I'll collect the results later. We want as far as is possible to abstract the details of this away. I mean, that, that could couple really tightly to your underlying compute infrastructure, but we don't want it to as far as is possible. We want the astronomer, the person who's defining this pipeline, to worry about the science logic and let underlying workflow engines and smarts figure out how to best schedule that and run it on whatever compute infrastructure you are available for. There are a bunch of different technologies here that I'm not going to even try and attempt to enumerate, but you can start with things like the common workflow language. By the way, the blue text is a link um, and the slides are in Slack, so you can follow the links if you're interested. But you can start by checking out things like CWL and Dask if you're interested in this stuff. Software repositories, when someone comes to our science platform and logs in and they do their, they come to our portal, they enter their username, et cetera, and say, right, I want to start my analysis. What we don't want to give them is a blank page and say, okay. In fact, what we want to give them is a rich environment that is set up and ready for them to use. We want to have their favorite tools, whether it's AstroPy, whether it's CASA, whether it's TopCat, whatever it is, sitting on the system, ready for waiting for them to go. But we also want to make it possible for them to augment that list, to write their own software to save it to publish it when they create a new tool we want to be able to store it and make it available for others to use on the platform and of course this ties really critically into keeping track of software versions key part of the whole provenance and reproducibility story another strike tangent people keep saying containers 
I suspect that everybody knows what a container is, but just to make it really explicit in this context, when we say containers that typically come up when we start talking about these kind of software repositories, the container is in this context basically just a way of packaging up all the compiled, unlike manage, uh, software that is necessary to carry out some particular task and distributing that as a single versioned blob so that I can take all the software I need to perform some task, put it in a container, and in principle, at least with some caveats, I can then move that from system to system when I get a completely self-contained reproducible environment. So usually we talk about things like Docker and singularity in this context. In fact, there are a bunch of other buzzwords and logos and things that appear here as well. But that's what we talk about when we talk about containers. It's really self-contained, rigorously versioned, re redistributable software packages. We talked already about collaboration, and I think this is hard to emphasize enough how important this is. The science is fundamentally collaborative. Whatever platform or whatever tools we're building, if we're not thinking about how do we use this collaboratively, then we're not doing it properly. And so, of course, this then impacts on our science platform in a bunch of different ways. It implies that we already said, well, we'll need some kind of persistent storage. So when someone writes a notebook or analyzes some data, they need to be able to store it. But they also need to be able to share it. So that file system or whatever it is they're working on, that needs to be shareable. If they're working on code, ideally, they want to be able to work together on code. Maybe that just means they put it in a Git repository. Maybe it means you think about things like this. So this is joint editing in Visual Studio Code, where you literally have more than one person working on a piece of code at the same time. This is familiar for, to anyone who's worked on a Google Doc with more than one person. Um, we also, of course, want to think in the long term about, as people are wondering, how do we share credit when people work together on a project, how do they make sure that they are their identity, their name, their persistent identifiers are associated with whatever research artifacts come out of it. And all this then implies some kind of rich system of user and group management embedded in our science platform. I'm not going to say anything significant about the virtual observatory because Jesus talked about it quite comprehensively yesterday, but just to mention that the VO makes a bunch of this possible and certainly the interoperability part possible because it gives us common data models and common standards that we can use to talk about data. It means that when I'm sitting on an SKA science platform and someone else is sitting on a Rubin science platform or a CTA science platform or whatever it is, we have a shared set of ways of describing our data that mean we can combine and work together on the same projects. Finally, for, the, for this kind of list, list of, of important aspects, I want to mention very briefly the API. So this is some kind of idea that remote software Python script running on my laptop or whatever it is can call into the science platform and ask it to do things remotely. So I can build machine driven applications that build on the functionality available through the science platform. Um, this is really exciting because it means our platform is extensible. Others can augment it and expand on it to do whatever it is they need. All right, that was my whistle stop tour of um, what I think is nice to find in a science platform. This is where it becomes a little bit more real because I want to talk about what I was asked to talk about, the SKA science platform vision. And so there is a document. This is the SRC science and analysis platform vision document. It was drafted towards the end of last year. It's actually still out in the SKA science collaborations for review before it is public. So I can't just hand out copies of it to everybody. But it says what the SRC prototyping team would like to build in terms of a science platform. The not entirely coincidentally, it may not surprise you to learn that it basically says everything I just spent the last 20 minutes, 25 minutes telling you. So effectively, all of the things that we talked about, all the things that I said, here is what a science platform looks like. Here's what we'd like to provide. So would these people. Um, we, so I think this is great news. I mean, I think that means that what the vision for a platform in the SK era is, is really powerful, really does address a lot of the big questions or a lot of the ways in which working with these kind of huge data sets will be challenging. Of course, it's not, it's not quite as simple as just saying it does everything John said, because it's actually more complicated because the SRCs is a distributed network of data centers rather than a single pile of computers in a corner somewhere. It needs to be architecturally advanced to give you a consistent view over those multiple SRC network sites. 
And also we need explicitly these draws on an SRC layered architecture. There are underlying data services, compute services, et cetera, that are being defined by other teams in the SRC network. And then the science platform is layered on top of that. It's kind of the top layer in the, of the sandwich in the diagram I showed you earlier. There are a bunch of principles that are identified to drive the design of that SRC science platform. Um, I'm not going to read them all out here because I think this, these slides are available. You can go and read this text for yourself, and I don't think any of them are really surprising. But one that I want to really draw attention to is the last one on this list. So it says accessibility, um, because I think that, again, is something that historically astronomical software has been bad at. We build software to solve our particular science problem. And then we say, well, it, it's now adequate. It, it, I can type in some numbers or read in some data file and it spits out some other numbers at me. Great job done. But in fact, we, we realize more and more that making our software available to a wide community means that it needs to take account of whatever the special needs of that community are, whatever physical needs or other support needs that community has. We need to be conscious of them and building systems that will support and increase the impact of our software by making it accessible to everybody. So I think we really want to pay attention to that as we start building this stuff for the SK. The good news is we're not starting from scratch. So what I've done here is just thrown a bunch of logos of existing science platform like systems again there's a whole range of them some of them include all the functionality i've talked about some do parts of it some have entirely different ideas from me about what a science platform is but there's loads of projects out there that are already playing in this space and quite explicitly the ska effort is not starting from scratch it's saying well we should look at these existing software landscapes, see what we can reuse, see what we can build on. Maybe we can use their software directly. Maybe we just take their ideas and run with them and do something a little bit different in terms of the code. But there are a whole range of projects. Again, you can find this slide in Slack and you can Google these and do your research and figure out which of these are already providing things that are useful to you. So we're not starting from scratch. There's a complex universe out there and there's a big analysis effort that went on in the SRC development team to figure out how these are useful to us. And a couple of then projects that I wanna just draw attention to from that list, because I think they are particularly relevant and they're particularly driving the direction of where we're working at the moment. So one of those, which I'm just gonna mention quickly um, is CANFAR. So CANFAR is the Canadian Advanced Network for Astronomy Research. They have an operational science platform available now. You can hit this URL. You can go and use the CANFAR system. It's really cool. It does a bunch of the things that we already talked about. It makes pervasive use of containers. It is quite explicitly driving a bunch of the prototyping that's now happening in the SRC universe as we try and figure out what the SKA science platform should look like. So I really recommend checking this out if you're interested. That said, the one I'm going to spend more time on, partly because it is the, the, the final part of the, the title or the suggestion I was given for the talk topic, is escape. So escape, um, very quickly, the fast facts. Escape was an EC-funded project. Uh, the goal was to, roughly speaking, develop common e-infrastructure solutions that benefit a wide range of particle physics and astronomy research facilities. So there were 31 project partners across eight countries, uh, 10 S3 projects. If you're not familiar with the jargon, don't worry. S3 just means a big research project, if it's your big research infrastructure. Um, 16 million euros. Escape ran from 2019 until January 2023. Um, I'm going to skip over the work packages because they're not that exciting and just briefly talk about some of the things that Escape worked on. So the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is the Escape so-called data lake or the DIOS, the data infrastructure for open science. And so the cool thing about DIOS is that it provides a distributed way of managing huge data sets. If I've got data spread over data centers across a whole continent or across a whole world, the DIOS gives me a way of managing that data, making sure it's securely stored, making sure I can transfer it smartly from place to place. Um, making sure that it's managed according to the regular FAIR principles. Um, this is intrinsically cool. This is also, it will not surprise you to learn, exactly what's underlying parts of the SKA. So uh, it's 
the SKA infrastructure is still in the process of being prototyped, but the data lake tools developed in Escape are playing a major role in that prototyping process. There's also a software repository. So the Escape OSSR, the Open Source Scientific Software and Services Repository. And I'm sure there are more S's in there than there are in OSSR, but nevertheless, that's what they call it. Um, and this basically fills that software repository box that we talked about earlier. So I'm not going to dive into the depths of this, but this is built on Zenodo. It had this, this flowchart appeared on my previous slide about software repositories, which shows just how tightly coupled these things are. Um, but it's, OSSR is explicitly designed to both make software available now, so all the software that was developed in Escape was registered as part of this OSSR, and to preserve that software for future. Escape is fundamentally built around the virtual observatory. Uh, Jesus showed you this diagram, this diagram yesterday, um, which shows the landscape of services and systems that have been developed by the IBOA. What I've done here is annotated it with little, little yellow dots, and those dots show this particular technologies that the Escape project contributed to. So this really drove Escape. Everything that was built in Escape was really based around how does it fit into the VO infra landscape. And then, of course, it will not surprise you to learn that there was a science platform of sort. So ESAP, the ESFRI Science Analysis Platform, was actually a badly named thing. I don't like calling it a science platform. So what ESAP um, took the position, or ESAP takes the position, that you probably already have if you were a big project. You probably already have a bunch of infrastructure lying around. You probably got a Jupyter Hub system, or you've got a Slurm cluster, or you've got a big storage system, or whatever it is. And what you really want to do is find a way of packaging up all those different services and presenting them to your user community in a way that makes them seem like a coherent service offering rather than just someone's piled up a bunch of different services so that it, it turns your heterogeneous collection of stuff into a science platform. Uh, so ESAP is really a toolkit for building science platforms or for integrating your existing infrastructure to form a science platform. That said, you can go and use it today. There is an entirely unsupported ESAP demo system at this URL. It is, when I say unsupported, I mean it. It breaks all the time. We only have it stood up there in order to facilitate development. But you are welcome to hit it, to click around, to see what breaks in interesting and exciting ways. And it provides a bunch of the functionality that we already talked about in um, the discussion of what a science platform should do. But actually, I think more excitingly, it's also included in the SRC prototyping effort as the SRCs are trying to work out how do we build a science platform on SKA scale. They are explicitly looking at learning from potentially building on a bunch of the work that was done in Escape and delivered as part of the ESAP platform. So at that point, I'm going to wind up, I will point, leave you, well, first of all, with a few URLs here. Again, these are in the slide deck on Slack, so you can go and uh, read, follow up them yourself. But there is Pretty good documentation for ESAP. Huge thanks to Manu, by the way, for this, who, who spent a lot of effort in the final weeks of Escape actually making our documentation something readable. Um, but you can find all the code, all the uh, documentation, and more information about the Escape project as a whole from these links. All right, so just to conclude, um, in the world of big and complex data, the science platform really gives us the tools that we need to be scientifically productive. I'm trying not to at this to, to focus on exactly what constitutes a science platform, but we can probably agree that it's some sort of network connected next to data system that makes it possible for users to log in and do science with a whole different range of capabilities. And SKA has now established a vision. It's still just a vision. It's not code. It doesn't work. But there is a vision to make those capabilities available within the SRC network. And there are already a bunch of existing platforms and toolkits like Canfar and ESAP that give us at least a preview of what's coming and hopefully some useful things you can start working with today. So at that point, I will stop talking. And if there's time, I'm happy to do questions. Yes, we are going to see five minutes the, the agenda in order to allow some minutes for questions. So we are going to take off five minutes from the lunch, but I think it is worth. So there's some questions online or here. 
Yes, Mahama. Thank you very much. It was really interesting learning about Escape. Um, so uh, you mentioned that the online uh, version right now is a, is not fully working, but the, uh, you also mentioned the grant is finishing this year. So what's the future? Is it going to be improved as part of SKA or other um, right. things? Or so, so yeah. So the, so that that's exactly the vision. I mean, the, because of the what one of the bugbears that I get, I think we think also came up in discussion yesterday. The funding models are not well suited to sustainable projects. So we don't, I mean, as escape winds down, we don't have resources to provide an ESAP as a service, but we are actively working. Many of the people who develop ESAP are embedded in other projects like SKA, like also notably CTA is the other big one who have taken the ESAP code and are now using it to build their own things. And ultimately I hope it's su sustainable and supported for the long term as part of their infrastructures rather than as its own little ESAP island. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah um, thank you for, for this talk. Um, yesterday, Matias was talking about the uh, integration with DJI and the federation uh, between the South African, Afri the South African cloud and, and EOSC. So my question is, uh, can anyone from out of Europe use this platform? So, yes, um, I mean, technically, absolutely. Uh, so the the access to, I mean, so we, we were governed, but we, we integrate with authorization and authentication systems, and we will provide, ESAP will provide you with access to the system based on whatever resources we can authenticate you as having access to. So at the moment, it's tightly coupled with the escape AI system. So it would normally give you, if you want big computing or whatever, it would give you access to that based on your membership of escape. But this, the software is totally flexible, so we can change it and adapt it. And if it's integrated with an SKA AI system, it will certainly be possible to give you access to systems in South Africa or wherever. Does that answer the question? Yeah, but but right now with the with, with the current IAM service, for example, can anyone out of uh, Europe really authenticate? With the current IAM, it would depend if if Escape were willing to give them an account. The answer is probably not, but I wouldn't like to say definitely not. Okay, thank you. Last opportunity for a PhD student. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned that there will be a different um, observatories will have uh, each one its platform. And can you explain more about how this uh, can um, uh, join together or how they can work together in different wavelengths? I, I, I can try. I'm not sure that there is a single great answer I mean, in fact i think it, it's one of the um exciting areas to think about if you're if you're interested in thinking about the technology behind this as well as the science outcomes so in the in the short term what we can certainly imagine is extensive use of the vo protocols so if you heard jesus's talk yesterday where he was showing how you can use tools like tap and adql to access data what I could imagine, for example, is sitting in my SKA regional center on an SKA science platform, but using tools like maybe Topcat or maybe working directly in Python to send VO queries to say a, a Rubin data access center to pull in optical sources that I could overplot on my SKA images. So that, that's the zeroth order, the simplest form of interoperability. And I think we, we, we have to target that for the first version of these platforms that seems to me like it's going to table stakes to get started i think one of the then the interesting topics to think about in the future is to what extent we can work towards a more homogeneous science platform infrastructure and that's in some sense the argument that the desai at our white paper from the american decadal review was talking about saying that we we should instead of working to a model where each project builds its own science platform, we should look to establish more common shared infrastructures. That's hard from the when you're coming at it from the SKA perspective, because SKA is so data intensive compared to basically everything else that's out there that it's hard to think of a 
a shared model in which SK doesn't just overwhelm everything else, but thinking about in the future as we move forward, how we go beyond just VO standards to shared infrastructure and actually co-locating data is, I think, a really important next step to take. Thanks.